This episode was made in collaboration with One Dime. Be sure to check out their video, Planet of the Robots, after this. Ten years from now, you could lose your job to a robot. In all likelihood, a robot that does your job better than you ever could. It's inevitable that, over time, more and more jobs can and will be replaced by automation and a variety of labor-saving technologies. And while the exact number is up for debate, a major study by Oxford University estimates that nearly half of current US jobs are likely to be automated or computerized with our current technological trends. Already, we see robots and artificial intelligence driving our cars, taking over the farming industry, writing entire news articles, and even diagnosing and treating medical patients. In grocery stores and McDonald's, low-wage jobs have been replaced by customer-facing robots and touchscreens. Depending on how we respond to this trend, our possible futures can look very different. In this episode, we're looking at what we can expect from this future automation. Or rather, what we can expect in the very different possible futures of automation based on the decisions we make to fully take advantage of our society's rapid technological innovation. For simplicity's sake, we'll restrict our analysis to two scenarios. A high degree of automation under a capitalist economy, and a similar degree of automation under a socialist economy. But first, let's start with a history of automation in general. If you're willing to go back far enough, humanity's evolution has always been directly related to our ability to mechanize and improve upon our physical abilities with tools. Our bodies and societies have progressed alongside and as a direct result of our ability to create objects that make our lives easier, that allow us to produce and consume more efficiently and in greater quantities. At first, it was simple handheld tools made of stone, then crude metals, until eventually we started truly automating basic tasks by powering the first primitive machines with flowing water, steam, and finally, fossil fuels. We continued innovating, creating ever more complex instruments, until they moved beyond completing simple tasks and started dealing with abstract concepts, the same way our brains can. Very quickly, we get to something like proper automation, machines doing things on their own. Specifically, we get to automation under our current economic model, capitalism. Since the origins of modern capitalism coincide roughly with the beginning of industrialization in Britain, that's where we'll start. At its birth, industrialization radically changed many things. The new machines of the industrial era were nothing like the tools that had dominated the history of humanity. They were bigger, more complex, and they needed several people with very particular roles just to function properly. They could produce like no human ever could, and with ever-decreasing levels of human involvement. Right away, this made a massive difference in the working arrangements of most people. From individual shops and farms, industrial machines and factories brought hundreds away from their personal businesses under a single factory roof in increasingly densely populated cities. Supervised by a growing but tightly guarded class of wealthy individuals, workers from neighboring regions were brought into factories, where they no longer had control over the process of production. Their roles became specialized, repetitive, and dull. Work for a wage became compulsory for more and more of the population as the concept of poverty became legally tangible. Capitalism had begun, and at its core were the new machines. With this new social model came new relationships and interest groups, the owner class and the working class, those who owned the factories and the machinery, and those who sold their time and energy to them. While this is going on, machines are growing in their power. They do more, produce more, and take up an ever greater chunk of the responsibilities of workers. And this starts creating problems. Some of the first observers of this era, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, were quick to realize the impact that the ever more capable steam-powered machines would have on this new labor force. They saw, of course, the slums and depths of poverty that these industrial towns had created. But more than that, they saw a new form of power emerge. Automation subjected workers to invisible pressures within the workplace when, as production processes became more automated, human workers had to adapt to the pace set by machines, a pace determined by the capitalist who manufactured and implemented them. Unsurprisingly, this feature of automation hasn't disappeared under more advanced stages of capitalism. Take Amazon warehouses where workers who are entirely reliant on now fully automated systems have to adapt their working speed to the inhumane rate of maximally optimized robots. Workers lose their independence and their very humanity when they have to complete tasks in 11 seconds or less and take no breaks, otherwise they threaten to disrupt a long production chain of which they are only a minor part. 
automation breeds its own forms of surveillance, and by that token, its own discipline. The consequences are not just a loss of independence, but also a profound feeling of alienation, personal anguish, and the all-too-common injuries at a full 10 per 100 workers in Amazon factories specifically. And that's not all. For Marx, this power was only one side of technological growth. Machines gave the capitalists much more. For starters, these machines made for a perfectly exploitable employee. And it's pretty obvious why. A machine demands no wages. It doesn't demand adequate working conditions, reasonable hours, or bathroom breaks. A machine costs what it costs to buy and maintain, and every single penny of its 24-hour workday afterwards goes back to the capitalist. It's a perfect arrangement. At least, that's the way it seems. One Dime covers this aspect of automation extensively in his video. Of course, this arrangement has its own consequences. Suddenly faced with a new machine that performs better, cheaper, or faster, an entire workforce might be more easily undermined. In theory, its value plummets to the robot standards, allowing the owner class to threaten mass unemployment and eroding whatever resistance workers had created with their collective power. If the employee is not entirely replaced, their job either becomes more menial and alienating or more brutal and unprofitable. Workers are pitted against the machines they are now directly threatened by, rather than the capitalist class, which can shield itself behind the values of technological innovation. Today, this process is happening across all sectors of the economy. Factory jobs were of course the first to go, but they were soon followed by many service and white-collar jobs. As AI progresses, even highly specialized tasks are delegated to machines, taking with them jobs for which humans are no longer the cheapest option. And this poses a dilemma for workers. Asking for higher wages is both good and necessary, especially as living costs everywhere go up. But it puts them and their industries at greater risk of their labor being automated. You can't bargain when someone is holding all the chips. So rather than settling for low wages out of fear of automation, we should embrace automation, demand higher wages, or perhaps some form of universal basic income, which will not only be necessary for workers, but may even be necessary for capitalism itself to function. But before we get to that, let's take automation under our capitalist system to its logical conclusion based on where we are today. Let's picture what the future of capitalist automation might look like. Technology, AI, and automation in general have improved to such a high degree that the only remaining jobs performed by humans are the few that can't be learned by an algorithm or performed by a set of pistons. The pace of change of new technologies will have gone too quickly to corral people into new job sectors, to the extent that these job sectors even exist. Robots do it all. In a capitalist society of widespread automation and computerization, three classes naturally emerge. At the top sit the rich and powerful, those who own the machines. Below them, those who still have non-computerized jobs and who will naturally be mainly providing services to the wealthy. And underneath them, the jobless masses, the majority of humanity. Things look pretty grim in this future. The first consequence is, predictably, extreme inequality. Under our current means-tested, insufficient, work-conditional methods of welfare distribution and the total absence of a cap to wealth accumulation, existing trends will only continue to drive larger and larger gaps between the rich and the poor. The effects of inequality we see today will only become more extreme, and with even less recourse to organized power. That leads to the second dramatic consequence of a highly automated capitalist society, corporate totalitarianism. A capitalist monopoly on robots virtually guarantees an even more dangerous monopoly on violence. If the ruling elite are no longer reliant on the working class to flourish, workers will be regarded as useless. And if they try to fight back for a better society that benefits the majority, the capitalist state and corporate elite can use their monopoly on technology to crush resistance in even more frightening ways. While today, interests between workers and capitalists are contradictory, a capitalist economy manufactures mutual dependence between the two groups. Workers depend on wages to live, and capitalists rely on workers to produce. Once that relationship is gone, suddenly an entire class of people becomes disposable. To quash the threat that an organized movement would pose to this new social order, the ruling class can either respond with totalitarian control or minimal concession. This would be the end game of inequality. A tiny handful of godlike figures would have total control of this automated society, and everyone else would be left to die, detached from any possibility of scraping together a decent life. 
These are the dystopias of science fiction films like Blade Runner and The Hunger Games. Unfortunately, we are headed right for them if we don't fight for a post-capitalist future. While it is by no means a complete solution, widespread automation makes an urgent case for UBI, a universal basic income. If it becomes impossible to provide full employment for everyone, and wage labor is the only way to guarantee the money you need to live, a system that can no longer produce jobs but relies on people buying things to exist needs to find a way to make sure that happens. So people turn to UBI. And it's not an entirely unrealistic idea. If capitalist governments become desperate enough, they might even consider UBI out of necessity to ensure the short-term survival of capitalism. For one thing, UBI is pretty easy to implement. Unlike the means-tested welfare programs our politicians usually favor, any universal program that applies to everyone makes for an incredibly simple bureaucratic process. Everyone gets a monthly check. Regardless of how much they make, whether or not they're employed, whether they're living alone or with others. Eliminating any complex calculations on the government's or citizen side, or any of the ceiling problems you see with conditional welfare programs. Overall, this can bring some well-needed stability. And in a system where jobs are scarce but productivity is high, it's a fairly natural conclusion. There are tangible benefits. Unfortunately, that's about as far as UBI goes. UBI doesn't really guarantee you adequate living. Implemented from above by a capitalist government, a UBI is likely to look like our welfare programs today. Not very generous at best, and a Trojan horse to privatize the entire welfare state at worst. Regardless, concessions like UBI offer us the best case scenario under capitalism. In the more likely worst case scenario, elites would see no problem with relying on brutal, right-wing authoritarian forces. An increase in violence, in poverty, and in inequality would separate the haves from the have-nots. And as we've already seen when people resist these trends, there is little hesitation to meet them with military force. The masses would be left to die, and the elite would enjoy the benefits of their privatized gains. This is what extreme automation can look like under capitalism. It is disempowering for the many, and inconceivably profitable for the few. At the top, those who benefited from millions of jobs being cut. At the bottom, everyone else. This will happen, because in many ways, it already is. But what does an alternate future, one under a socialist society, look like? The simple answer, much better. Unless you're within the top 1% of the capitalist class. As a quick refresher, a socialist economy is one in which the means of production, meaning factories, machines, farms, and so on, are owned in common rather than by private individuals. This can vary quite a lot in practice, but the basic idea is that the economy is subject to democratic practice, not the whims of deeper pockets. In general, socialist economies are characterized by the provision of basic services to everyone, Food, water, shelter, and medicine for all are the greatest priorities of this economic model, rather than profit, which often comes from gatekeeping these essential needs. In this kind of system, automation looks very different. While automation under any system can bring improvements in the quality of life for all, under a socialist economy, it does not do so at the expense of the security of the individual. You might lose your job to a more productive machine, but that won't suddenly throw you into your savings and threaten to kick you out of your home. Quite the contrary. In practice, this can mean any number of things. Where innovations in medicine or agriculture are developed, they are no longer held hostage by intellectual property patents so that only a few people can gain access and only for the highest prices. Vaccines and other life-saving innovations don't have to be life-saving and profitable to be worthwhile. They can just be life-saving. This is innovation under a very wide lens. But automation specifically works in just the same way. And the best way to prove that is to look at how automation affects work under a socialist economy. Whereas the capitalist exploits the advancements of technology to pit the workers against themselves, bringing down their wages, working conditions, or kicking them out of their job entirely, a socialist society has no such pressure to exert. Work being taken out of human hands is just that, no strings attached. Even if automation does not abolish all work, in capitalist or socialist economies alike, it will definitely reduce the amount of work we have to do. Whereas a capitalist system responds to this with unemployment, worsening working conditions, lower wages, or even meaningless jobs that only serve to increase profits without improving anything, a democratic organization of the economy can simply grant the worker more free time. Picture your average day at work when automation has all but taken over. 
with fewer responsibilities and fewer hours of human work needed, divided across more people whose jobs are also largely taken care of, a work day could be just a few hours long, if that, a work week just a few days. You could return home after a short day, knowing that your needs are taken care of, allowing you to spend your free time whichever way you like. More time means you can take up more hobbies, continue your education, or simply enjoy your life a whole lot more. You could take pleasure in activities that make you more fulfilled, or choose to spend your time working in your community, teaching classes, helping to plant trees, fixing potholes, whatever you want. In our current society, this kind of freedom is a luxury awarded only to the lucky few. Under its automated extreme, that same freedom is lost to meaningless work, to fatigue, and to desperately trying to stay afloat. In a system where your survival isn't directly tied to the hours you work, automation is a blessing, both for you and everyone else. Automation grants you more freedom rather than punishing you for simply existing in a society with scientific progress. It could allow us to move beyond our basic necessities and start climbing up our hierarchy of needs the world over, to start pursuing what really interests us in life, to take up educational, artistic, innovative, or creative pursuits that we would normally not be able to under capitalism without taking immense personal risks or being born into similarly immense privilege. The truth is, we've been waiting for this for decades. Back in the 1930s, economist John Maynard Keynes predicted that technological advancements would allow his grandkids' generation to only work for 15 hours a week, long before automation and artificial intelligence showed us the extent to which human labor could be replaced. The only reason we aren't there yet is the unnecessary capitalist obsession with always extracting more profit. But we can improve our lives without that suicidal greed. And so long as we continue to ignore that fact, our future is clear. This is an incredibly important and complex topic, and we've only just scratched the surface here. If you want a more in-depth look into the various possible futures that automation could bring, be sure to check out One Dime's video, Planet of the Robots, next. It's a fascinating look at one of the most pressing issues of our time. His video goes into the possible dystopian futures that automation could bring, as well as more favorable futures if we can achieve socialism or communism. This kind of content is made possible by my patrons on Patreon. When I decided to make the shift from general interest stuff to more radical political content, I knew I ran the risk of sinking my channel and losing my ad revenue and sponsors. These days, it's pretty hard to get a sponsor on my videos. I have one reliable one, and they're great, but for the most part, I'm having to rely on the generous support of viewers like you. If you appreciate the work I'm doing, and you're able to chip in even a dollar a month, I would greatly appreciate the support. As a little show of that appreciation, Every patron, regardless of donation amount, gets early access to every video, as well as access to our patrons-only Discord server. It's a great place to hang out, chat with other like-minded people, or learn about socialist theory in our book club. I'm also pretty active in the server, so you're always welcome to ping me to ask a question or just say hi. You can find my Patreon, join our growing Discord server, and get early access to every video at patreon.com slash secondthought. If you enjoyed this video, consider dropping a like. If you hated it, a thumbs down. You can check out my previous videos by clicking the links on your screen. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.